Welcome. Happy Tuesday evening to everybody. This is Revolution, and we have a very, very interesting show. Uh, I'm kind of excited about this show today. Um, the more research uh, I've been doing for the show, um, the more kind of like head scratchy I get about it. like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize this. So before I get into this anymore, let me bring in my co-host, my homie, my dog. You may know him from his tweet storm that he had over the holiday weekend. You may know him from his fiery approach at, at uh, podcasting. I know him as maybe the nicest man in all of Miami. Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to the man. Don't yeah. tell me I, internet problems already. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jason's shirt has a collar. I've invested five dollars in collared shirts. Colored shirts or collared shirts? Both. Shirts for colored colored shirts colors. for collared colors. Col shirts for colors. With colors. We have an interesting show today. We're going to talk the the uh, initial title of this was I think it was uh, debunking myths of environmental racism. I think we're going to explore certain myths of the idea around the term environmental racism and get deeper into that whole thing. And we're going to go way back, way back. I'm talking 1700. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going to go from the seventies and the austerity government of is it Coleman Young? Is that the Detroit mayor? Yes. To bringing in Haitians to uh, to do some gardening in the West. So before we start, let's let me start with a, a little clip that uh, Pascal and I worked on over this holiday weekend when he wasn't yelling at black right wingers. <laughs> Can you hear? Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that responsibility is met. That's why I'm here. To tell you directly that I see you and I hear you. <laughs> we invest. Uh, can, can I get some water? Come on up here. I want a glass of water. Get a bottle. Bottle water. Get a bottle. I want a glass of water. Oh my God. Oh, I can't I, I can't believe you chose it. <laughs> this is disgusting. Watch this, watch. No, I got the listen. I, I got the glass of water. This is not a stunt. What? He, he wet his lips. He did not drink it. He didn't sip it. He wet his lips. There was an audible gasp in the audience. People were just like absolutely dejected. Why would you do that? water crisis to newer New Jersey water privatization schemes, capitalism is fostering multiple environmental, economic, and health crises affecting the working class and poor around their drinking water. Are these realities rooted in a problem of systemic racism? Or are these factors further examples of how capitalism is cannibalizing the poor and working class while larger segments of black America are part of that class? We will discuss race, capitalism, and infrastructure in this episode. This is Revolution.
All right. So without any further ado, let us introduce our guest coming all the way from the University of Houston, Texas, the Cougar, Josiah Rector. Good afternoon. Peace and greetings, comrade Josiah. And and nice another talk, one of these Illinois State University professors that we just keep getting from our good friend Tere Reed. Keith Plymers. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Peace to brother, brother Keith. Keith and greetings. Can you guys hear Keith? Yes. You all hear me? Okay, so I'm having that problem again where I can't hear can't hear him. So Ooh, if he talks, Pascal, you're gonna have to I'm gonna drop out for a little bit. So you wanna you wanna start with the first question, Pascal? Yeah, I mean I mean you, you guys are into deep stuff here, but I wanna go to Keith first because Keith gave us a really deep historical little uh, narrative. I don't want to say vignette because it's not fiction. I would like you, Keith, to talk to us about how in Barbados, which was the first British colony the Africans were brought to, how the British brought certain types of African slaves to engage in certain type of tasks because they understood and knew what their environmental skill sets were at that time and around what year that happened. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Pascal. So uh, the first people of African descent who were brought to an English colony happens in 1616 in Bermuda. Um, and Bermuda is a colony that's associated with Virginia. They have a lot of overlap in who's in charge, but they bring uh, an unnamed uh, African person on a ship with what they call West Indy plants. And he's brought to Bermuda uh, along with other people of African descent pretty quickly after to do a few things. So one of the first ones uh, the English think they find pearls there, and the guy they bring to dive is like, no, it's no good, you can't find it. And they decide they don't want to listen to their experts, so they bring uh, enslaved Africans from the Pearl Islands, which are Spanish islands off the coast of Venezuela, as expert pearl divers. And then they also try to farm stuff on their own. They have a couple of disasters that they accidentally bring, eat all of their corn, and they can't figure out how to grow things like manioc or cassava without poisoning themselves. And so they're looking for people who know what they're doing. And so they're specifically looking for people of African descent to be experts. And so in those first three years, uh, one of the things that helps kick off slavery in the English colonies is this belief that people of African descent have unique and special environmental knowledge that English people don't have. So they're kind of brought as experts. Um, you have people being named. There's a man named Francisco who shows up in some of the colonial records as the best curer of tobacco in the entire Caribbean um, and the only person who can keep the English from screwing it up, which they do constantly. And so early on, there's this real belief in African environmental skill. And then interestingly, in 1619, a year that's become quite famous um, for its Virginia connotation, Bermuda gets a new governor and he says, enough of this environmental stuff, we need slaves. And he's the first person in Bermuda to use the word slaves specifically and to articulate this idea of labor um, that is not about environmental expertise, but in the very next line in the letter, he says, well, and also while we're at it, it would be good if, if we got asses, if we, if we got donkeys to help with labor. Um, so you can see the way in which ideas about environmental knowledge and expertise, and then this brutal labor system are going to be sort of juxtaposed against each other a lot early on. So what's fascinating about that, and the reason why I wanted to bring that up, is that one of the canards told by sheer racist and historians, particularly of the types who are criticizing critical race theory, even though I'm not an advocate per se of critical race theory, but the actual true historical nature of the racialized aspects of, of race in the West is that the belief that Africans were somehow ignorant or subpar intellectually is completely and absolutely 
bankrupt in the face of the fact that Africans were brought off because of the superior intellectual skills they had with agricultural crops as well as well as certain commercial products that Europeans did not have. Am I correct? Yeah, and, and it's not just, so this is the first case, it's there from the word go, and it, it continues well after that. Um, so there's a book by a historian named Judith Carney called Black Rice. Right. And Black Rice Hypothesis. Yep. So, so she breaks down the ways in which in South Carolina, um, rice agriculture is drawn pretty heavily from West African models. And with whether it's curing tobacco, whether it's knowing how to uh, plant things like yam, uh, cassava, things like that, that English people, I mean, they screw it up constantly. And cassava, for people who don't know, um, it is toxic if you don't process it correctly. So there's there's all these 17th century records in which English people are like, oh, horrible stomach ache, or someone <laughs> ate it and like didn't go super well for them. And then they're like, ah, like yes, the our, our enslaved person, like they figured out what to do with it. Um, in the comment, the name of the author of Black Rice is Judith Carney. Yeah. Um, I think but, also yeah. this is more. Yeah area than mine, but if I could just interject, I think I read that some of the, the rice pestle technology used in the Mali Empire was actually transported at one point to the Carolinas. So, I mean, the English didn't know a damn thing about any of this, basically. And, and so, yeah, West African rice production, uh, including specific technologies, were transported or at least influenced the, the, what the plant, plantation owners in South Carolina were using, I believe. Yeah, and, and to the comment that just went up on the screen, um, you know, one of the things that happens with this, this governor in Bermuda in 1619, you know, he really is attempting to, to create a labor system that is about brute labor and not about expertise. And he's, he's going to try to sort of denigrate the skills of Africans to do so. Um, so, so you can see that early on, there are these efforts to try in order to achieve sort of ends for this guy's vision for how labor should look. Um, he, he's working really hard to to denigrate Africans. There's other people stick around. These fights about skill and lack of skill and sort of the origins of, of racist ideas about ignorance, lack of skill, you know, they emerge really early on as a way to try to, as you see these fights about what the labor system should be. Yeah, we know how Bacon's Rebellion had a big effect on that as well in the 1600s in Virginia. Absolutely. So the next question I want to go to is that moving to the contemporary era, environmental racism and infrastructure. Josiah, I listened to your podcast appearance with Black Agenda Report with Nellie Bailey. I really appreciated it. There's so much to cover here, but I'd like to go, I can't let this go, to the Flint crisis and Obama. Can we talk about for a good three minutes about the sheer duplicity and treachery of the fact that Barack Obama as a black man whose presidency is based on leveraging African-American aspiration for being part, at least, and respected part of American political history as the first black president, who really is just a corporate neoliberal tool ma manufactured by Robert Rubin, the Hamilton Group, and uh, you know Citibank, his sole presidency, goes to Flint, Michigan, where they have poison water, lead poison water, killing people. And in order to take these people who look at this Trojan horse, duplicitous, vapid Negro as a hero who are dying from this water. He takes a sip of water in front of them to encourage them into believing that the Flint water is safe. Can, I, can, can we, uh, I'd like to hear you guys elaborate a bit on that if you can, but if Josiah, if you want to touch on it. Yeah, I mean, I would just say um, uh, I my research has focused on the sort of water system of Metro Detroit, including Flint and the role of austerity policies in producing these water disasters, both in Flint and Detroit, um, where you have on the one hand about 100,000 people getting poisoned in Flint, leading to hundreds of miscarriages, uh, Legionnaire's disease poisoning, increased birth defects, and of course mass uh, lead and copper poisoning causing neurological problems with children. And then in Detroit, we've had 
around 300,000 people having their water shut off in the same period. And you have thousands of people living without running water for years in Detroit. And this is all happening in the aftermath of the subprime mortgage meltdown. What I would say about the Obama administration, beyond the debates about Obama's specific intentions, is on the one hand, you have the elevation, the, the sort of the, the sort of breakthrough in, at, at a symbolic level in terms of racial representation, in terms of the first black president. But at the same time, the utter devastation of majority African-American cities like Detroit and Flint, but also Milwaukee and across the country um, in the aftermath of the subprime mortgage meltdown, where you have mass subprime foreclosures, brutal austerity policies, the decimation of people's wealth. And in the case of Michigan, it was even worse in some ways than Wisconsin and other places because you have these emergency manager laws, which are a bit like Puerto Rico's financial oversight board, where the governor appoints these unelected managers who take over the city and whole school boards and just ruthlessly impose austerity policies. And that's what leads to the Flint water crisis. And that's also what leads to an intensification of these brutal water service disconnections in Detroit, among other things. And I could say a lot about the background of that. A lot of this is also about busting public sector unions and the right wing think tanks like the Mackinac Center, which are funded by the Koch brothers and other like right wing billionaires. Um, but basically, uh, the Obama administration, you know, 10 million people lose their homes, of course, after 2008. And the homeowners, the homeowners uh, modification program, HAMP was a bit of a joke, right? Like only about a million people are helped by that at best. And a lot of the money that goes um, in, in the case of Detroit, supposedly to homeowners ends up getting taken to fund blight removal and sort of flipping properties for predatory lenders and banks. So there's a total failure to prevent the home foreclosure crisis. Um, and there's also a tax foreclosure crisis. And you have these austerity policies that are deadly and just absolutely devastating to these cities in the Rust Belt in particular. I'd like to add that uh, I was working in, uh, in finance, <clears throat> real estate finance at that time. And I remember even before the meltdown, uh, Detroit, because of austerity policies, was definitely going through a hard time. And so people were losing their home due to you know tax liens. And yeah. there was a, a, a wholesaler wholesalers came in. So you know these you know a lot of big venture capital came in. They were able to buy uh, entire zip codes, entire portfolios. This is this right. is even before again the the bailout. Right. And you could buy a home. Uh, in Detroit and get one free. There would be two for one deals. And that's how cheap things were in Metro Detroit. Yeah, I mean, for example, there's a, a financial services executive named John Hansi. John Hansi is worth about 100 million, I think. And basically, he's bought up these whole neighborhoods in Detroit on the cheap. He got all these sweetheart deals from the Detroit City Council. But what happened is we've had over 100,000 tax foreclosures in Detroit just since 2010. And a lot of that is because the, the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit didn't adjust the tax assessments following the crash in property values. So Detroit already had these depressed property values prior to the crash, partly because of the legacy of housing discrimination against African-Americans, partly because of deindustrialization and other factors. But so the average home price in Detroit in 2006 was, at the height of the housing bubble was only like 80,000. But in 2010, it falls to like 17 or 20,000. But the city is still assessing taxes at the higher rate. People can't afford to pay the higher taxes with these rock bottom property values. And so they just get foreclosed on by the county. And then they get bought up by these predatory speculators like the guy John Hans I just mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like you have 130,000 uh, foreclosures in Detroit since 2005. And a lot of this is just bought up by sort of speculative real estate capitalists and banks to, to flip um, and redevelop. Josiah, then, Hans, Hans is not the guy who had that plan of making urban farms, is he? Well, Hans also um, bought up this, this large tract of land. There's, there's a geographer, uh, Sarah Safransky, who's worked on this. I would recommend her work if you're interested. But yeah, he's, he bought up this sort of urban woodland um, and, and he wants to do sort of commercial agribusiness in Detroit, but he's probably going to flip it uh, basically just to, just, just to sell it off to, to the highest bidder at some point. Josiah, if, you, if, you, if you can give us some background, based on your academic and professional work, I'm going to ask you an opinion question. What, I mean, not that this is a diversion, what causes the crisis in Detroit? Is it, as many racists would like to say, yeah. the uh, complete and absolute uh, political ineptitude of the black political class mayorship in Detroit? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. it the way in which neoliberal capital had always structured Detroit, going back 
to the deindustrialization de period of the 70s? Is it a combination of a class politics of the black political class working with corporate and commercial forces to neutralize the black poor and working class to their advantage? Right. Or is it a, a, a product of just greed capitalism without race? Or is it a product of government policy? I think it's that? all those things. I mean, I mean, here's what I would say. So in terms of the structural factors that lead to the long-term problems of Detroit and to, in a slightly different way, Flint and many cities like them across the country, I actually think uh, Adolph Reed's uh, article, um, uh, uh, the Black Urban Regime, Structural Origins and, and, and Constraints, which was later adapted for a chapter in Stirrings in the Jug is one of the best accounts of the position of black mayors like Coleman Young and then later Dennis Archer uh, and Kwame Kilpatrick in Detroit, but also similar, you know, Kenneth Gibson in Newark, Richard Hatcher in Gary, Maynard Jackson in Atlanta, et cetera. And I mean, it's a combination, right, of on the one hand, deindustrialization. And in the case of Detroit, if you compare it to a Chicago or even an Atlanta, it's hit much harder because it's much more of a manufacturing based city. Its economy is less diversified. A place like Gary or Flint in some ways is even worse off uh, uh, because they're smaller. Um, so on the one hand, I mean, like Detroit had 349,000 roughly manufacturing jobs in 1950. In 2007, it had 27,000. So it lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs in the second half of the 20th century. Any city would have been devastated by that. I mean, it's comparable to towns in Appalachia where the coal mines closed. And you look at the levels of poverty after the coal mines closed. On the other hand, there is absolutely they become majority black cities because of the interaction between the second great migration and explicitly racist housing policies that, you know, I, I think in Detroit, as Detroit is becoming a majority black city between 1965 and 1980, hundreds of thousands of whites are moving to the suburbs. And the story of redlining is well known to the audience for this show and, and to all you guys, so I don't need to rehearse it here. But in addition to the fact that African-Americans could not get FHA loans in the suburbs of Detroit, so there's zero black homeowners in, I think, like 12 of the suburbs surrounding Detroit as late as 1968, when African-Americans, even if they are middle class and able to, to buy a home with or without FHA mortgage assistance, they can face cross burnings and fire bombings trying to move into the suburbs of Detroit. And in Flint, similarly, whites harass um, African Americans are trying to move in. So you're talking about cross burnings. I mean, as late as 1975, a black family was firebombed for trying to move into one of the suburbs of Detroit. That's 1975. Um, and, and so, I mean, it's a combination of, of sort of white supremacist terrorism and policies like redlining and so forth that result in these black majority cities being surrounded by lily white suburbs. Now, in recent decades, the suburbs have become a bit more diverse and it's a little bit more complicated, but those are the fundamental structural origins of the, the issue. So, so these black mayors inherit cities with shrinking tax bases and with higher poverty rates than their suburbs, which of course don't want to be annexed by the city. They don't want to share resources with the city. They don't support metropolitan transportation policies. And indeed, in some ways they freeload off the city as, as Reed points out. And they come in and they watch games or they commute to their office jobs and go out to the suburbs, but don't contribute to the tax base. Um, but then th these black mayors are also dealing uh, with austerity policies first under under Carter and then Reagan, cuts in federal aid to cities. And there's a lot of ways that you could critique the black mayors of Detroit and there's outright corruption under Coleman Young, or excuse me, under, under Kwame Kilpatrick. Although actually Young and uh, his successor Archer were not corrupt. Um, they were, they were, you know, austeritarian um, and, and they in many ways did the bidding of the bond market, but I would argue that they didn't have a lot of room to maneuver in that regard. So, I really don't think that, that Coleman Young or, or his successors could be blamed for the city's decline. I would, you know, they certainly did the bidding of corporate interest to a certain degree. I mean, you can see this with, uh, you know, they gave all these tax abatements to General Motors. General Motors kind of screwed over both Detroit and Flint. I mean, in the case of Flint, there were 80,000 GM workers uh, in, in the 70s, whereas now there's like maybe 6,500 GM workers in Flint. Um, so both cities lose like half their population. They lose all these manufacturing jobs. Companies like GM extract tax concessions, but they use capital flight basically to extract concessions out of both workers and city governments and give as little as possible back, move to the su suburbs when they can, and then eventually overseas. So, I, I mean, the, the, of course, the, the black mayors of these cities 
end up imposing austerity policies and corporate friendly policies that harm the majority of their population. And they use a rhetoric of racial unity in some ways to dress up what is ultimately a pro-corporate agenda. And then, but I don't think it's corruption. Say say that again for the people in the back. (laughs) Well, I'll say it again. I mean, it is true that black mayors, and this is another place where I encourage people to read the read piece. They use a rhetoric of racial unity to paper over the fact that ultimately uh, they're advancing the interests of a predominantly white capitalist class that holds most of the cars in the deck. So they, they, they say that these policies are all for you know black residents of the city, but most black residents are getting screwed over. There's a small middle class layer that does benefit from things like affirmative action policies and police departments. So like Coleman Young did have more black police officers and more black public sector workers. So there were some gains, but they disproportionately went to the black middle class and then the black poor and working class mostly get screwed over which had already been happening before him. And I don't, it's debatable how much he could have done, but, but the language of racial unity is certainly part of an ideological uh, uh, framework that's used to, to defend policies that don't really help the majority of the city's population. Shameless plug, I wrote a piece in Black Agenda Report, you might've read Josiah called the, uh, the fallacy of racial kinship politics. Exactly, yeah. Discusses this completely is why the notion of having Absolutely. a super black, super black, black community, we all in it together, the notion of black politics is a charade and always has been. Right. And that black politics needs to be a class politics where poor and working class blacks align with poor and working class whites who are not, and Latinos who are, and Asians who are not poisoned by racism to challenge capital and the ruling class for an agenda that is to their benefit. The not yeah. being poisoned by racism is gonna be the hard part, but there are yeah. people that you can get over that because it's happened in the past. And that all of these comprador pro- professional managerial classes of all races can be mild mild by that class politics and try to create a, a reality in which this society transforms either to a revolutionary socialism or to a democratic socialism or anarchism or whatever else, but that the capitalist parasites are taken out. You guys disagree with my theory? You disagree with my theory? I agree with all that. <laughs> I, I mean, I can give you just an example. You said it's happened in the past. So, you know, if you let me indulge me to jump back in 17th century Bermuda for, for just one minute. Um, in 1660, there's a revolt that absolutely terrifies the people in charge. And they have this totally bizarre way about it. Uh, so just a few years earlier, there's a giant revolt in Ireland. They killed a ton of people. Some Irish people shipped off to the Caribbean various ways as servants. And there's a number who turn up in Bermuda. The governors are like, oh, all the Africans here are going to convert to Catholicism because they really like Catholicism and want to. And they're going to join with the Irish to get rid of English Protestants. You know, of course, the, the people in charge are, are thinking in just like an absolute nonsense way about it. What's really behind it is you have people who are being worked, who are being oppressed, not in the same way, but by the same people. And they realize like, hey, we know who's screwing us and we can fight a re- we can fight a war. We can have a giant revolt. We can burn some plantations in order to try to put a stop to this. So like. There's a long history of people crossing, at that point, a color line that's not quite hardened, but that's becoming harder to say, we know who's screwing us and we're gonna fight back. Bacon's Rebellion. The, yep. popular, you know, the, the Colored Farmers Alliance and the Farmers Alliance of the, of the eight, late 1800s, destroyed by Booker T. Washington, the black communists and the socialists of the early 20th century. You know, Scots, who paid for the Scottsboro boys. Of course, because many black folk in the 50 year counter revolution, as you know, that's a major theme we have here, have been divorced from their radical anti capitalist political history, which there would be no black radical, there'd be no left politics in America without black people, as we know. That's part of our theme here as well, because we realize the ruling class has been trying to obfuscate black people from this tradition and make it a white thing to maintain the hierarchy of capitalism. We know that black people were some of the vanguards in the left radical politics in America, I would say from the beginning of slave rebellions. But the point being that is that this is an illustration about how class politics, as Adolf Reed, as Bruce Dixon, Black Agenda Report, Torrey Reed, uh, Cedric Johnson, uh, Paul Robeson, uh, you know, C.L.R. James, 
uh, you know, uh, the tradition of black left think thinkers, Claudia Jones, have been saying for years, Hubert Harrison, that black people need a radical left, anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-sexist, and anti-imperialist agenda that is rooted in the politics of the majority of people in America or poor working class that does not sacrifice the cultural, ideological, or intellectual integrity and autonomy of black people. That's the key. And that's why it's got to be done with people who are not poisoned with racism and don't try to use class reductionist nonsense. It's like Amy Therese to say things like, if you complain about the white working class, you're working for racism in the white working class, you're working for the ruling class. You know, petite bourgeois PMC, you know, demosoc types who are very common in today's age who don't understand that rate capitalism in America, as I'm sure you guys know, demands racism to make, as all good Marxists know, to relegate black people to the reserve army of labor disproportionately yeah. to keep in the minds of the white majority that only black people fail from capitalism. You guys are totally academic? Yeah. Am I, am and I, I think Amy Therese is a good example. I mean, without derailing the conversation into her, I mean, I think she's a perfect example of just a historically ignorant. I think it's almost like because neoliberals try to use like race and gender against Bernie Sanders. Now, anyone who talks about racism must be a neoliberal, which is bullshit. Am I allowed to swear? Um, <laughs> as if you can't reconcile a serious class analysis of capitalism or Marxism or whatever with actually being honest about about racism historically or in the contemporary world. I mean, it's a ridiculous false dichotomy. Um, and I think, but but I don't, I don't regard her as a serious person. I don't think she's ever written anything. She's just someone who blathers. Um, but you can't actually look at the facts of the history and-, and I don't think she's real person. Shout out to Janice B. Graham, my mentor and good uh, radio friend. I'm always happy when Janice Graham is here. I see she's, she's happy about the commentary. Janice yeah. Graham, check out Our Common Ground Saturdays. At 10 p.m., you can see it on Facebook. Jason, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, Amy Therese is not a real person. <laughs> I'm on record saying it. I don't Amy think until until Amy Therese comes out and you see a real person <laughs> say that bullshit in real life, it's just it's just an avatar and probably a group of people. It's not the first time shit like that has happened, and it will not be the last. Um, I did want to. What we have a, <clears throat> a little less than a half hour for this first hour, and actually, before I even ask this question, do you guys have time to go to the bonus half of the show? We're all good. Oh, Jason, you listen, you, know, you guys have been watching the show for a while. Your patrons, you know, that the party doesn't get started until we're there. <laughs> <the half hour. laughs> this is just a commercial for the cable <laughs> part of the show. To, for adults only. Um, I read your I read your piece that you that you sent over, um, Josiah, on uh, on on the idea of um, we when we talked a little bit about it on the phone um, mm -hmm. when you called, and I wanted to read a little bit from it because I think it's interesting. Uh, on May 2nd, 1976, Lillian Benbow, director of the housing program at the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, delivered a speech at the United Auto Workers Working for Environmental and Economic Justice and Jobs Conference at Black Lake, Michigan. Benbow said she was happy to come and see some people who were concerned about the environment and working on it, concerned about jobs and urban ills. However, Unemployment in Detroit increased from 11.5% in 73 to 23.6% in 75. Social distress was mounting, especially among African Americans. Meanwhile, amidst a national energy crisis, auto manufacturers publicly blamed environmental regulations for job losses, something that we still hear today, right? Um, in this context, Benbo questioned whether existing environmental policies helped African Americans. Is the lack of a job any more devastating, she asked, because it is eliminated by ecological guidelines than because of racism? Turning to housing, she asked, is planned land use any more restrictive because of environmental standards than exclusionary zoning designed to prevent minorities from living in suburbia? 
Benbow recognized that on average, African Americans in Detroit suffered more from pollution than whites in the suburbs. But unless environmental policies addressed racial discrimination, urban poverty, and unemployment, they would reinforce inequality. During a panel on the environment and the poor, William B. Ratliff of the Greenville, South Carolina Urban League made a similar plea for environmentalism to be linked to a full employment and civil rights agenda. The basic causes of environmental and economic injustice, he argued, were discrimination, over-concentration of wealth, and a shortage of economic democracy. In order to overcome these conditions, he said, environmentalists, community activists, and workers need to support the economic goals of full employment, income maintenance, and a more equitable redistribution of wealth. Yeah, oh, there was a brother from the Urban League, the National Urban League said that? William <laughs> Not, not exactly known for radicalism, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and well, that's one of the, the more treacherous fatback and biscuit civil rights organizations since the beginning. I mean, Torre has exposed those Negroes from the beginning, yeah. but I'm shocked. Sure, but, but I do think that that quote s s indicates the extent to which in the mid 70s, even a group as, as kind of, you know, centrist, uh, middle of the road, whatever you want to call them, as the Urban League, viewed full employment as a, 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 st a, a central policy goal. Right, like that, that was central in liberalism in a way that would be totally marginalized 10, 20 years later. And I think that moment in 76 around the debates about the Humphrey Hawkins bill in particular is necessary for thinking about the origins of the concept of environmental justice, which is one of the points I try to make in that piece. And look where the Urban League, the Urban League is now, you know. You oh, have, sure. Yeah. You know, now that you know, the charter school pimps pu pushing public school privatization under Obama, that gets what, 500,000 black and brown and Latino teachers fired while creating a school to prison pipeline and agenda, which is exactly what charter schools are, at which the USA, USA Today article exposed. The NAACP even argued to fight charter schools. All of a sudden, all of these, you know, fat back and biscuits, Negroes who were asking for charter schools realize when Betsy DeVos becomes secretary of education, the racist struggle that, that she is that, oh my God, maybe charter schools are not the answer to the question. Maybe this is a racist ass capitalist plan to destroy education for poor and working class black people. But again, you know, the black political class is treacherous and duplicitous, and we know that that's always been the case. But I was shocked to see that in 1975, they woke up and got a pill of reality and realized that they had to at least do something to challenge the modicum of capitalism. I guess they were afraid of, uh, maybe they saw Jimmy Carter coming, who knows? But um, that's a good little point. Well, Josiah, Josiah, would you uh, kind of talk about how the Carter administration actually really kind of came in and, and really hamstrung this because he had an administration that was right. an austerity yeah. administration. Yeah. And they definitely, what was it? Uh, his keynote address, uh, Carter's assistant secretary for neighborhoods, Monsignor Gino C. Baroni, <laughs> yeah. framed an urban environmental agenda that broke decisively with New Deal liberalism and faith mm -hmm. in the regu regulatory state. He declared that big government, big business, big right. private sector, big public sector has created a dependency that has to be shattered. That was a democratic right. administration. I'm gonna yeah, so I mean- it was Jimmy Carter, right? It was Jimmy Carter. I think this is a very important turning point, right? Because- okay. um, Can I say something? I book, book plug, Judas Stein. Yeah, because of the Talk I draw about the in, John Judas Stein's work in that article among others. So yeah, I think neoliberalism with the key ingredients of deregulation, privatization, austerity, and a monetary policy focused on limiting inflation at the cost of increasing unemployment, and especially the Volcker shock, that really starts in the second half of Carter's uh, term in office. And it's, it's 79, 80 that I think is the key turning point for neoliberalism, and it's kind of the preview of Reagan. But I mean, one pe thing people often forget is that like it, the Humphrey Javits bill, which is the predecessor to the Humphrey Hawkins bill, actually, called for setting up an office of national planning and um, and would have lowered the national unemployment rate to 3% within five years through a huge expansion of public sector employment. I mean, they were thinking in terms of social democracy, but at least some uh, in the labor movement who supported Humphrey Javits, including, uh, you know, Walter Ruth. Well, actually, he, he had died in 1970, but his successor, Leonard Woodcock, and, and other labor leaders, including like the International Association of Machinists, um, the left wing of the labor movement was calling for social democratic type policies. Um, and, and there were some like the A. Philip Randolph Institute uh, that, that had been calling for things like this going back to the freedom budget. 
And there was a moment where some people were trying to connect notions around the environment to a full employment agenda in the mid 70s. And in fact, what I show in that piece is that the concept of environmental justice really originated in an attempt by some elements within the labor unions to push back against corporate uh, attempts to use uh, uh, layoffs and plant closures to fight against EPA and OSHA regulations because a lot of these companies were telling workers as well as city governments, we don't want to limit our toxic dumping in the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, right, or, or the, the Detroit River or elsewhere, the Hudson River. Um, we want to be able to continue dumping toxic waste and sickening workers with pollution, et cetera, just like we always have. We don't like these new regulations instituted under Nixon. And if you force us to comply with the Clean Air Act amendments in 1970 or the Clean Water Act or OSHA, we're going to close our factories and we're going to move at the very least to someplace like Louisiana where they might not enforce the rules or eventually Mexico, et cetera. And some elements of the labor movement forged alliances with some more progressive elements of the environmental movement and said, look, if we had a national full employment policy, corporations couldn't pull this off so easily because we would be creating public sector alternatives and we could even have, you know, like a public jobs program in conservation or in solar energy. There were some people that were basically calling for a lot of what's in the Green New Deal in the mid 70s, but it all gets defeated under Carter. And a lot of that is about the politics of inflation uh, the well-documented rise of the think tanks and the sort of corporate lobbying apparatus around the business roundtable, the National Association of Manufacturers, and then, of course, um, the decision to appoint Paul Volcker to the Federal Reserve, nearly double interest rates, impose a recession in 79-80, while also imposing deregulation and the like. And, and that story is fairly well known, but what I think is not well understood is that that shifted the center of gravity in debates about uh, unemployment, but also debates about the environment to the right, because there could have been a, a, a unity between groups that were calling for uh, jobs programs, cleaning up pollution and anti-discrimination. And it could have actually come together, but it was destroyed by the politics of austerity and the industrial. And if yeah. I can just flag up, yeah. oh, yeah. this, this is under the Jimmy Carter administration, yes. not Reagan. Exactly, before Reagan. As, you know, Adolf, Reed, as Adolf, Reed. Adolf Reed always says, we got more from Nixon than any Democratic president after him. So we can, can we argue, I mean, you know, in his book, Knocking the Hustle, Lester Spence makes the argument that the neoliberal turn really starts with Nixon, with the Milton Friedman agenda, as well as with urban policy, as well as leaving the Bretton Woods standard. I don't know if you guys agree with that, but uh, some would argue that it really kicks off under uh, Jimmy Carter. What are your thoughts? Do you think the neoliberal turn starts with Nixon and really just ex proliferates with Carter or does it start with Carter? Um, and I, I don't want to stop Keith from weighing in either, but I mean, I mean, Nixon is doing, I mean, Nixon in some ways is still kind of a Keynesian, right? Like he, he's expanding government regulation. He doesn't do a lot to change the tax code. Um, uh, but on the other hand, Nixon is beginning kind of devol devolution uh, to the states with his sort of new federalism. So he's kind of and then, of course, as you've talked about in earlier episodes, um, you know, he you know, you have the Nixon shock and the shift of floating exchange rates and international monetary policy. But on the whole, I would say Nixon is still basically a Keynesian in his economics. Um, so I think the turning point is with Carter. And I think that that has a lot to do with the inflation crisis um, triggered by the Iranian revolution, but also the sheer the power of organized labor and the so-called wage price spiral and the, the, the way that capital uh, wanted to break labor's bargaining power in that moment in the late 70s. And I think that, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of aspects of this, too. I mean, like Nixon, in some ways, was closer to organized labor than Carter was. Uh, with mm. his hard hat policy, whereas Carter had very weak relationship with organized labor. I mean, he did a little bit of outreach, but he basically, as Stein shows in Pivotal Decade, um, didn't really get organized labor or care a lot about it. That also has to do with his background in Georgia. But I think the fundamental issue was just Wall Street and, and corporate America was getting much more and more well organized and they were ready to go on a huge offensive by the late 70s. And they had a lot of apparatus to do it. Let me get, I'm going to ask two questions. Number one, answer this. Do you think the, the discourse about the Powell memo 
is really kind of sophistry and overplayed? Or do you think that really has a serious role in the actual neoliberal turn? And where's what's the role of Milton Friedman in this as a treacherous? Some people say he's the originator of neoliberalism. I'd like to know what your thoughts are. I think that I think the Powell memo, memo matters. I think Friedman matters, but I think um, I think these I so I think the Powell memo indicates the extent to which the capitalist class was becoming, you know, to use the sort of old-fashioned Marxist terminology, it's it it's going from a class um, in itself to a class for itself. I think, but basically, can you, the, define, the, can, politically can, you organized the, can you define the Powell memo for our audience, please? So Lewis Lewis Powell was a Supreme Court justice, and he wrote this this memo to I think it was like the Chamber of Commerce, Business Roundtable, and other business organizations in seventy one, and he basically says that the free enterprise system is under attack, and you know this is coming after the Weathermen bombing Bank of America branches. It's you know on the one hand you have Nixon's environmental regulations and this wave of wildcat strikes in the auto and steel industries. And then you have this kind of liberal activism around things like consumer uh, uh, rights with Ralph Nader. And then you have the environmental laws, you have Earth Day. And he's sort of saying like corporate America is under attack, right? Like the, the workers want higher wages. People are telling us to pollute less. We're being told not to discriminate against women and black people. Um, and we have to put a stop to this, right? And, and, and you know, it's also couched in the Cold War rhetoric of, of the encroachment of international communism, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but but he's basically telling the business roundtable, National Association of Manufacturers, you guys need to get off your asses and fight harder than you were before. Um, and there, there is a sense in which um, there, there is an increase in corporate lobbying activity, the formation of political action committees. I don't have the statistics at the tip of my tongue, but there is this massive increase in corporate lobbying in the 70s. And it is part of a self-conscious move to politically organize in part spurred by the Powell memo, but also, I mean, just by, you know, the, the activity of all these law firms, think tanks, et cetera. And I think people like Friedman do, I mean, if you look at Paul Volcker, for example, he's influenced partly by Friedman. He doesn't call himself a monetarist, but he calls Say himself- Say it again, Say it again for the people in the back. Say it again for the people in the back. Well, Paul Volcker, who was the one who imposes the Volcker shock, which I would argue is the keyest, the most key turning point in the shift from Keynesian to neoliberal economics. It, who's a point who runs the Federal Reserve basically at the end of Carter through most of the Reagan years. Uh, I think it's 79 to 87. I could be getting the last date wrong, but he called himself a practical monetarist and that he thought that the money supply was key to sort of the health of the economy. And also he agreed with Friedman that controlling inflation at the cost of increasing unemployment was a necessity. And so he was very right wing and he was certainly influenced by Friedman's ideology, although he didn't call himself a Friedmanite. But I mean, people like Friedman have been saying a lot of this stuff since the 50s, but their moment was the 70s. And I would argue it had a lot to do also with larger structural shifts, including the declining rate of profit, especially in manufacturing, as people like Brenner, or Robert Brenner have shown, uh, increase in competition from you know Japan and Germany, especially in the auto industry, but also in steel. Um, so, you know, capital is facing a profit squeeze, which inflation intensifies for the financial sector. And what the Volcker shock does is it, um, it intensifies deindustrialization, it makes imports more competitive, and it raises profits for Wall Street and the financial sector, and it accelerates um, the, the movement of capital into finance. It accelerates financialization. And the dominance- And it starts before Ronald Reagan. This is under Jimmy Carter as well. Exactly. It starts in 79, and, 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 and there's this huge recession in 1980, which I gotta say too, people, they, when they talk about the 1980 presidential election, they, they say, oh, it was about the Iranian hostage crisis. Yeah, that was part of it, but the main reason was that you just threw millions of people out of work with this massive engineered recession right before the election. You know, if you look at what happened to steel workers and auto workers in the year before the 1980 presidential election, they got totally thrown under the bus under Carter. So big surprise that some some of them didn't vote for Carter, and and it was less about the so-called Reagan Democrat than people just not showing up to vote. You had lower voter turnout um, increasingly in the 80s, and some of this was about the austerity policies. And of course, there's an environmental aspect that gets tied into that, right? Everyone says, oh, Jimmy Carter said put on a sweater and, and that's why he lost. And that's why we should never, ever do environmental regulation ever again. I just wanted to pop back to, to flag up something. Maybe Josiah doesn't want to uh, pat himself on the back too hard for this. But 
you know, the, the thing Josiah's piece that, um, that Jason read from earlier does that's so important is it tells a story in which the environmental movement is not just about suburban liberals who are starting to get concerned with, uh, like, is my baby's milk safe? Not that that's not a serious thing, but right, there's, there's all of these stories about environmentalism that in some cases are, are at least a little bit true, which you tell a story about middle class people, about nearly exclusively white people, about very little consciousness of labor. Um, and you have this now in our popular political discourse, right? It's why Make the Road and other, other groups in New York who are talking about a just transition, you had a really key negotiation with unions in New York State around environmental policy. It's one of the reasons for the industrial policy with the Green New Deal and all the bad press people got to get over. There's this history that's in a lot of people's heads in which jobs and labor are on opposite sides from each other and in which environmentalism is either a hippie movement or a college movement or a middle class movement. And the thing that's good about Josiah's piece, it's really worth kind of hammering this one, is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You know, if we're looking for a usable past to say, oh, can labor and environment get together? Yes. Right? Yes, that's I mean, even, it. Even going back to the freedom budget, like A. Philip Randolph, I mean, they were already saying we could create all these public sector jobs cleaning up the pollution. And by the early 70s, 100,000 people a year were dying in the United States from occupational diseases. I mean, who is the biggest victim of pollution? It's, it's workers. You know, I mean, that, that's a massive death say toll. It again. Say it again for the people in the back. That statistic. Say it again. By, by 1970, it was estimated by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, the research arm of OSHA, uh, that 100,000 Americans were dying every year from occupational diseases. If you look at working class people, both white and black, Latino, Native American, Asian, they were dying at these hugely high rates from uh, pneumoconiosis in the coal mines, bisonosis from the textile mills, occupational cancers among steel workers and auto workers are very high. Um, you had, of course, pesticide poisonings among farm workers. I mean, there were no restrictions on the ability to poison and kill people with pollution until the 70s. And and that death toll is like this massive sort of hidden, uh, uh, you, you know, devastation of the American working class. I mean, that that's often ignored. When people talk about pollution like it's this middle class issue. Who is being killed by pollution? It's not the middle class and the wealthy. It's the people working in factories and mines, et cetera. But they're forced to choose between that and their livelihoods. And they're pitted against uh, the sustainability of the planet by capital and opportunistic politicians. But it's not completely unnecessary to force them to do that. Well, say, oh, you know, choose between your, your living until the age of 65 or having a low life expectancy or having a paycheck or, you know, it's, it's absurd. Well, listen, I'm a pro, you know, I'm pro union and we know unions are the key to middle class jobs, but I want to pivot on Janice P. Graham's statement that we should not romanticize oh, no. labor, union, labor union bureaucracy oh, no. and administration because I oftentimes agree. they sell out and, and actually conspire with right wing agendas to protect their relationships with the ruling class. Can you, Ooh, give yeah. us, like, can you give us some examples of how in this era uh, labor unions were actually are stabbing their worker membership in the back, if you have so. Well, if you look, for example, at the United Mine Workers, there were these rebel groups like Miners for Democracy that were trying to democratize the UMW, but then you had uh, gangster leaders like Tony Boyle having people assassinated. I mean, I think Jock hey. Kowalski, I, I could be getting his name wrong, uh, was killed. Similarly, in the Teamsters, you had Teamsters for a Democratic Union. In the UAW, you had new directions. There were these dissident groups oftentimes led by by new leftists or black power groups or feminists, whatever, they were trying to democratize it. But yeah, you did have this bureaucratized, in some cases, very corrupt union leadership that had been racist. in bed oftentimes, very extremely racist. Um, so absolutely. Um, and, Shout, and out to Amy off, Therese. Shout out to Amy Therese with that one. Yeah, I mean, she's in denial about that basic history and we could definitely have a long conversation about racism in the labor movement. But yeah, it was deeply entrenched and it didn't really change, including the monopolization of skilled trades jobs by white men at all until the affirmative action era. And that's one of the reasons why affirmative action was necessary. And it often gets attacked. But it, without that, you know, like white men were monopolizing all the good jobs in a lot of these steel mills and auto plants before they closed. 
And please only say, that again, say that again for the people in the back. Say that again for the people in the back. White men were, were monopolizing the skilled trades and the apprenticeship jobs. And, and the point you were making earlier, I mean, there's the sort of racist trope associating skill with, with whiteness is nonsense. But there was a monopolization of the apprenticeship programs and the skilled trades jobs and a lot of these blue collar fiefdoms. And it persists even up to the present, especially in the building trades. But affirmative action was necessary to dismantle that system of white male privilege uh, uh, that excluded black men, Latino men, and women of all backgrounds from these jobs into the 70s and persisting in subtler ways to the present. So, so let yeah. me say, let me So let me make this clear. For all those people like, you know, Sagar and Jetty and the, the Hill and, and Crystal Ball and all those other dem socks who say affirmative action was not employ important, only elite blacks benefit from affirmative action. Nonsense. They don't right know that. People, people like that you know, worthless slime ball John McWhorter, working class <laughs> black and brown people had to use affirmative action to get into the labor union movement in certain key trades in the 70s, correct? Including places correct. like Flint. I mean, I've, I actually am, am friends with one black woman who is a, an auto worker from Flint, and she was one of the first generation of black women to get a, a well-paid job, Claire McClinton. One of the first women in her generation to get a, a, a well-paid job in an auto plant in the 70s, and that was because of affirmative action. She never would have gotten that job without those programs. It was totally dominated by white men before around 1974, 75. And I think Josiah, you, I mean, you've written about this too. A number of the ways that jobs and particularly hazardous jobs are distributed within plants were also based on just racist ideas, color lines, ideas about, you know, particular vulnerability or just that, you know, some people deserve shit jobs and they get stuck in them. So yeah, even in, in, the, in the auto industry, black men were almost always put in the Coke ovens and in the auto industry, they were almost always put in the foundries, which is where you breathe dust that causes silicosis. And these see, jobs, you, people, again for the, you gotta say it louder and again for the people in the back, Josiah. Well, I, yeah, well, I mentioned the mass death from occupational diseases, and that was also racialized because black workers, in particular, in both the steel and the auto industry, were systematically shunted into the most dangerous jobs through the affirmative action era. And those were the jobs that gave you high rates of silicosis, lead poisoning, and occupational cancer and heart disease. And, and that as a result, you had a, the short life expectancy. As a matter of fact, in Detroit, black men's life expectancy actually fell in the 1970s. And there are multiple reasons for that. But one of them is that black men were all being given the, the shit jobs. And that's why you got groups like the Detroit Revolutionary Union Movement led by General I Baker. I love the Detroit Revolutionary Movement Movement. We got to have a show on the Detroit. You know, yeah. Josiah, do you feel qualified to do a show on the Detroit Revolutionary Union Movement? Yeah, I mean, my, my research is actually related to them because I, I have a book coming out on Detroit where I talk. I actually interviewed General Baker's uh, widow, Marion Kramer, who's also a very important activist in Detroit history. But yeah, the drum was calling out I mean, look, they're, they're a good example of why it's absurd to pit anti-capitalist and anti-racist politics against each other. They were saying, look, yeah, it's a racist system, it's a capitalist system, and they were not opposed to cross-racial alliances, but they also were not blind to the racism in the auto plants, which was extremely overt, uh, very overt. I mean, like there were literally no black men in, in management positions in a lot of these plants. And oftentimes it was a segmented white male labor force. We often you have the second generation Polish white male immigrants, for example, in a plant like Dodge, Maine. They have all the skilled trades jobs. They're the foreman. And then they're bossing around these black men who in many cases are, are first or second generation Southerners coming in the second great migration, trying to get a leg up in the auto industry and facing racial slurs, being sent to the most dangerous jobs. No big surprise that a lot of them rebelled. And now we, I mean, we want to understand how important the struggles of black and brown and working class people were, because thank God today, black people are the most unionized population in the United States per capita. But the, no one talks about, we talk about all these fat back and biscuit civil rights leaders, but no one talks about the blood, sweat and tears of black working class people working in factories. My mother was a 30 year member of the 1199 nurses union. I couldn't have gone to college without the union movement. So no one talks about how working class union member people busted their ass to make this country a better place for people. And it's sad that we have duplicitous Negroes who go to Cornell Law School on their mother's union benefits who try to dispose of the importance of anti-capitalist politics and the union movement just because they're, they're, they're insecure about the fact that that is low level of income potential because mommy had to subsidize their <laughs> That's
that's what happens when Pascal drops the hammer on people. <laughs> you get the WWE SmackDown clip. So on that oh, note, we are an hour. Go ahead. We're we're an hour in. We're we're gonna we're gonna shut this down. Say our goodbyes, Josiah. Uh, because I was having some audio difficulties, I was I was hiding in the back, watching the show. I'm definitely going to make some jokes about Josiah in the other half, looking like he is doing this from county jail. Because <laughs> definitely, I told you I have a boring background. I admit that. Yeah, I didn't know you had a prison background. <laughs> All you need is a fucking glass and a phone. You want me to put some money on your books before this shit is over? I have a pretty good internet connection for this. This <laughs> Keith, I didn't hear a word you said, but from the comments and the responses, it looked like it was some beautiful shit. I could see your face being very animated, but I got to go back and listen to it. I'm really hurt. Uh, I'm going to fix this by the time we get on uh, for the for the bonus half. So if you guys aren't already, become a patron. It's easy. I'm going to put the link up right here for you guys to do it. Bam. Do that. You want to hear the second half of this discussion? Become a patron. And all the other fun patrony shit that we do. We have movie night that actually we've kind of been lagging on. And I will admit we've been lagging on it because of all the other projects that we're doing and all, all the other patron only stuff. We're doing a special patron only nerd show Friday with Matthew Film Guy, Matt McManus, Gene Bajalan, uh Conan Neutron, a bunch of fucking people. Uh so a lot of stuff is going on on the patron in. If you guys are patrons, the link is already up. And both guests are joining us, so it's going to be a fiery second half. You see you see how fired up Pascal is? You see that? He hasn't unfrowned. He's ready to look in. Here it comes! <laughs> He's ready for that. It's coming down. So on that note, Jason, Janice Graham says she's, I want a night of guitar music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, that's coming too, Janice. Don't worry. It's all coming. It's all happening now. So on that note, we are out. <laughs>